Hi everybody, my name is Danica Joan and I am my co-host Wendy Perry and you are watching Custody Matters Live. So today's special guest is Dr. Jennifer Harmon. I have been touched personally by her, but this is the first time I've actually been able to meet her and speak to her. Um, she, I saw her TEDx talk uh, the, a few years ago, and it's something that I show a lot of my co-parenting participants in my co-parenting classes. So, um, and I love it. I just really hones down to what it is that we're all about as far as children ha having a loving relationship with both parents. So, Wendy, why don't you do a little introduction? All right, I sure will. Well, I want to start by reading Dr. Harmon's bio, which I did get from her website. So I'm just going to read this. Uh, Jennifer Harmon, PhD, received her doctorate in social psychology from the University of Connecticut in 2005 and specializes in the study of intimate relationships. She also has two master's degrees from Teachers College, Columbia University, in psychological counseling and served as a family and substance abuse counselor for several years prior to her entry into academia. She is currently an associate professor of psychology at Colorado State University. Dr. Harmon is an accomplished and awarded teacher and has published many peer-reviewed articles and uh, book chapters and has presented her research regularly at scientific conferences around the world. She has also co-authored numerous books such as The Science of Relationships, Answers to Your Questions About Dating, Marriage, and Family, and Parents Acting Badly, How Institutions and Society Promote the Alienation of Children from Their Loving Families. Dr. Harmon's areas of research expertise focus on the topic of power in relationships, power in how intimate partners influence each other for good or bad. As an applied social psychologist, her work has applied social psych psychological theories on intimate relationships to the study of public health problems ranging from STI prevention to domestic violence. For nearly the last decade, her primary focus has been on the study of parental alienation. Dr. Harmon regularly conducts trainings for legal and mental health professionals on parental alienation and serves as an expert witness and consultant on civil and criminal cases involving parental alienation and other forms of family violence. She is a single mother of two amazing elementary aged boys and a stepmother in a blended family of seven, and they live in Fort Collins, Colorado. And I also want to mention that Dr. Harmon will be the keynote speaker at the Revealing Unseen Child Abuse Symposium in Houston, Texas on October 18th, 2019. And her TED Talk on parental alienation has had thousands of views. And uh, Danica, as you mentioned, her TED Talk is amazing. It's uh, 13 minutes and it's just jam packed of so many thought provoking ideas about parental alienation. And uh, I'm very interested to talk about her TED Talk and also about her studies about uh, power plays and intimate relationships because parental alienation uh, is all about a big power play. <laughs> uh, from, from what I uh, have observed, we'll let her talk about that. So Dr. Harmon, thank you so much for joining us on Custody Matters Live. Yeah, thanks for having me on the show. So, so the thing that I, that I really, I got from your TEDx talk was that, first of all, we, we all have stereotypes that we view the way that a mother should be, the way that a father should be. And we, um, and what I also, so I took away that, oh, wow, we really do. And maybe we should, should see things as more gender neutral. Second, I took that um, it doesn't matter if one po uh, party stays toxic, you can still by, um, create some neutrality so that the child can have a loving relationship with both parents. Would you like to explain more about that? Yeah, so um, a lot of my research, in fact, I have a new paper I'm about to submit where we show there aren't actually gender differences in who perpetrates parental alienation. But where we see the gender differences happening is when it uh, comes to court right, or when it kind of continues on and you involve mental health professionals and other people. And I think what struck me and when I started doing this research are the gender biases that would enter in at that point to create more gender disparity, 
right? So even though moms and dads do it um, and they do alienating behaviors differently um, or somewhat differently, um, the, the way that it's perceived by mental health providers and by neighbors and other family members gets um, warped because of the stereotypes we have about moms and dads and what we expect of them. And so that's why in my research, I really wanted to try to study that better. Um, and, um, and I think stereotypes are something, you know, people, it's important to be mindful of, but it's important also to be mindful of all the ways in which it, it can drive how we perceive what people do, right? Um, so for example, a lot, you know, if we believe that dads are, or men are violent or more aggressive than women, which lots of even new research shows that that's not true at all. In fact, mom, men and women are just as violent. They're just violent in different ways. Um, that, um, you know, that, that kind of bias really can affect the long-term um, outcomes for that family because people will side with the alienator. They will turn on them. They'll testify against another parent who's innocent and hasn't done anything wrong. Um, and so my hope with the TED Talk was to try to get people to hopefully be more mindful of that and to not pick sides without knowing the full story about what's going on with the family. Um, and, uh, you know, and to address your other point, um, I think, you know, it's really important to try to equalize power in family dynamics where there's alienation because the alienator essentially they're driven by control and power. Like that's what motivates them. They want to control everyone and everything around them. And anytime there's a threat to that control, they engage in more behaviors to try to maintain it. And when they, they have all control and all custody, that's still never enough for them, right? They still always want more um, and more control. And so the best thing to do in that situation would be to try to help that child still have and maintain a positive relationship with the other parent because that's the only way they can kind of combat that um, toxicity that they're getting from this very abusive person. Um, and I know uh, Vittorio Vanzetti, uh, he's a psychiatrist in uh, Italy. This is something that he works on a lot in his research where he shows that you know this parental loss that children have when they have a healthy parent and yet they're living and, and in the full control of a very toxic parent or an abusive parent. Um, that's one of the worst kinds of loss that a child can experience. It's worth, worse than actually death of a parent. Because usually with death of a parent, a child still has a healthy parent that they're with, right? Whereas with alienation, they lose a parent who's healthy and they're stuck with a parent who's unhealthy. And so the outcomes for that child are even worse than death of a parent. I thought it was so interesting in your TED talk when you talked about these parenting stereotypes because I know um, for myself and probably Danica too, you know, this is what we do every day is we, we talk to parents and help parents dealing with parental alienation. And of course, talking about equal parenting often goes hand in hand with that. And so as I started to watch your TED talk, I thought, well, I don't believe in any stereotypes you know I'm really educated about this and then as I watched I thought oh my gosh this we all carry some of that with us right. and we probably don't even realize it um, I think one example that you gave was if a dad comes to a school event people are like wow he's super dad you know he's amazing he came to an event at school where it's just an expectation that of course mom does that and if mom shows up it's not a big deal and I, I recently saw that play out in a, a family court hearing where um, the one of the attorneys made a huge deal out of it that the mom had not been to a school event and she hasn't been able to because of her uh, job but Nobody said anything about the dad not coming to events, right. <laughs> yeah. um, but she was oh, really man. vilified because what mom does not go to school events. So uh, I've seen that play out recently in the family court, but also I think it's something that we all need to really think about how those stereotypes are ingrained in us and, and we might not even realize it. Right. Exactly. And I think, you know, in the legal, I mean, the, the, the lawyer's jobs are to try to do the best for their client. And so they will often manipulate those stereotypes to their favor, right? Um, um, so I think it's important to have good legal representation who can combat those, right? So if one person's trying to capitalize on that, it's important to call it out to the court and say, 
no, right? <laughs> it's like, mm-hmm. that's, yeah, why are you expecting this of this parent and not expecting it of the other parent. That's not fair. Exactly. Right. And, and that's something I wanted to see it. Like what I, I'm getting in the courts is a lot of times somebody throws the stone of you're, a, you're an alienator and, um, or a narcissist or all of these names that we like to throw stones with. Um, and uh, it just gets very complicated because now if you've got somebody who's being accused of parental alienation, now that they're trying to fight their way out of the hole. Right. Um, something you said in another video was that just because you do one alienating behavior does not label you an alienator. Just like right. hitting somebody doesn't make you an abuser. Yeah. Could you speak more right. on that? Yeah, so the way that parental alienation is defined is that there are clusters of behaviors that people do over time with intent to harm the other person, right? Um, and so a lot of, and, and I run into this all the time. In fact, I just conducted a large, three large national polls of Americans and Canadians. And I, I like, we asked people, do you feel like you're being alienated from your child? And we found that like over like 40% of parents felt that way which is a lot, or 30 to 40% of people felt that they, that was happening. But when we asked them in, a, in another poll, how many behaviors the other parent was actually doing, a lot of parents reported like only one behavior. Uh, and yet that was enough to make them feel like they were being alienated. Um, and so I think there's a real misunderstanding about what parental alienation really is. Um, just because, I mean, parents act badly all the time, you know, and people make mistakes all the time. You know, we don't, well, nobody's perfect. We're not always going to say the right thing to our child you know we might be angry we might be upset and but while it's not great that's not alienating a child that's not your child children are very resilient i mean even in the face of the worst severe alienation some kids somehow miraculously withstand it right (laughs) i mean there's other children who are very vulnerable but there are some children who can resist it and no parents perfect and people are gonna make mistakes but it's when people are doing these strategies over and over again as a larger kind of uh, approach to get control and custody and to hurt the other parent and their relationship, that's when it's alienation. Um, and we find, you know, my, my work, you know, I published a few years ago, we find it's about 22 million adults and I just published or I'm about to publish another paper where I confirm that number. So it's definitely, these are parents who are not reciprocating alienating behaviors the other parent is conducting most of them or all of them, and it's affecting their relationship with their child in a very negative way. And so it's very serious and it's, it's harming many, many people. And it's um, the person who's the target of it is often, no, they're, they're not reciprocating. They're not doing those behaviors. Um, or if they do a few, it's usually out of self-defense. And it's the same thing that we see with other kinds of violence, like with battery, because the closest, the closest type of violence that parental alienation is, it's very similar to intimate terrorism, uh, where you have one person who has all the power and control, and the other person is less powerful and dependent on them. And so with alienation, you have one parent who has all control and power because they have the child and they have custody usually. And the other parent is completely at their mercy to have any positive relationship with their child. Uh, and so that really limits the choices of the parent who has no power, right? If you have no power, mm-hmm. what can you do? You're trapped. You're completely, everything you do has to be to try to get, you know, have any relationship with your child. You have no control over the other parent at all. And they have all control over you. Um, and so a lot of times parents in that kind of situation, just like a battered victim, if they, you know, we see women actually, and in men too, who are victims of battery. I mean, sometimes the only choice you have is to push away and get the, the, the person who's beating you off of you, right? <laughs> in self-defense. Mm-hmm. Um, or you might say things out of frustration, but that doesn't mean that they're also reciprocating the alienation. Right. I mean, the, the victims of this are often very, very distraught and very frantic. And then, of course, it's easier for the alienator or the abuser to label them as crazy. Well, look at how they're acting. They're right, acting right. so hysterical. Well, of course I'm hysterical. You're, you know, <laughs> trying to turn my kids against me. Right. It's destroying my life. And so it really, unfortunately, it, it starts to kind of feed itself. And to outsiders, it, it might seem like that that's really what is happening is that this person is mm-hmm. out of control emotionally. They're 
I hate to use the label crazy, but that's what alienators mm -hmm. often call um, the alienated parent. And I'm wondering, I think it's interesting that um, you have focused a lot of your research on power in relationships. And I'm just curious, what made you interested in that uh, particular subject, power in relationships? Well, as you mentioned earlier, when you were reading my bio, um, I initially sort of, I've always focused on pu public health problems like domestic violence and substance abuse and criminal justice populations. And, um, and in that, all of that is power as well, right? Um, understanding intimate relationships, you have to understand power. Um, I just published a, a, chap a book um, on power and relationships that was published by Cambridge University Press where we summarize all the literature and, and we have several chapters written by the top people and top social psychologists and um, human development families psychologists um, and it so I think it's essential to understand power if you're ever going to try to understand intimate relationships because that's how we negotiate it's how we um, whenever you have problems or you have to cooperate with anybody else you have to understand how we exchange what we need from each other, right? How do we, do we, you know, sometimes in relationships, um, you know, that starts off as like a social exchange where like friendships, usually you have a friendship where you just meet somebody and it's sort of a tit for tat. I do for you, you do for me. But as people become more inter interdependent, their outcomes become joint. In other words, that when I do something for you, it doesn't just benefit you, it benefits both of us. Right, because you know, and this is what happens with marriage, right? People have children. The child now is a joint outcome of both persons. Mm -hmm. you know, both parents have this child in common, and the outcome there is shared by both. But what the alienator tries to do, and what abusive people try to do in general, is they want to control the outcomes for themselves. They don't want to share, and they're not always operating in the way that benefits both people. And so that's where it becomes abusive. And so the person who's giving and giving with the hopes that it will benefit all is gradually being depleted, right? And so, and that's, that's true no matter what area of study you go into. I'm just applying it to studying parental alienation because it's so obvious to me when I was studying, <laughs> when I was trying to figure out why are, you know, why are people doing this? Why, why are the alienators doing this? And, you know, about seven years ago when I, or eight years ago, when I really started reading this, um, reading up on what the research that's been conducted so far, I kept being left with that question. But why? What, you know, mm -hmm. and wh why is this going on? I mean, I understand that, you know, obviously alienators, they have pathologies. They have, you know, that a lot of them have so serious personality disorders or um, it's been, they've learned how to do this from their own families, right, of origin. Um, and so I knew that. But obviously that's a very clinical perspective. That's a perspective of, you know, people who are counselors and they're working with these families. Whereas I come at it from a social psychological perspective, I come at it from how do we understand the dynamics that's happening in this larger system, the larger family, um, because I think that's the only way we're going to stop this. And that's the only way we're going to better understand how to intervene with these families is to understand that power dynamic and understand what's motivating the people that are in this family. And then that's where we have to intervene. Obviously, you're trying to, but we're doing it to protect the child. Right, that's the main intent is to protect the child. But you, in order to protect the child, you have to step back and try to see who's the one causing all the problems. <laughs> so. well, this is something that I've said several times is in dependency court in Florida, we have a dependency court for foster family, uh, foster situations, and then we have the family court for divorce and custody. So in dependency court, the, the purpose, the, the prime directive is that the courts figure out a way to reunify child with parent, even if the child, even if the parent has been found guilty of abuse or neglect, they will do interventions in order to bring the family back together. Now, it's not a perfect system <laughs> and okay. by the least, but in the family courts, there is, a, ch a parent does not have to be found guilty. There may be accusations and there may be even some evidence, but they're not guilty of anything abusive or neglectful. And yet they stand to lose any contact with their child because of the, the, the skills and, the, and expertise of the lawyer that's representing the other side. Right. Yeah. And, yes. I, yeah. and, and so the legislators are trying to br build a level playing field by like Florida is a shared parenting state. They're trying to 
to speak on behalf of, of their constituents that we want equal shared parenting, but the judges can override legislation and, and uh, be pulled back and forth to, um, according to you know, the attorney's wishes. Right, right. Yeah, and I think you know, this is why you know, my colleague Edward Crook and I have been arguing in our recent publications that this is a child protection issue. Um, and when it's a child protection issue, then it moves it into that space where it's more, you know, you're trying to protect the child from abuse. Um, right now, it's not treated that way. It's not seen as that way at all in family court. Um, I think it's slowly changing. I mean, so I'm not going to say it's not that way, way everywhere, but I am seeing some movement to see it that way um, whenever I've testified in court. Um, and that's what I spend most of my time in court really trying to do whenever I serve as an expert witness is educating the court about you know, power dynamics and understanding the behaviors of the parents that are in the room and trying to make sense of it. Because I think they're always grappling with it. Like they see what these parents are doing and they just blame both of them and say, stop it, stop the conflict, you know, and that's all they do. And because they don't understand the bigger dynamic and they're not seeing that this is child abuse and they're not seeing that the children are really, really suffering, even though on the surface it can look like they're not. All they see is a child hating the other parent and they, they just assume that that parent has to have done something wrong to make them hate them so much. Um, and yet that's not, that's not a nuanced or a, a deep understanding about abuse and child mm -hmm. abuse. Wow. Children who are abused, children who are actually abused do not reject their parent the way that um, alienated children do. They don't. Uh, that's so important for people to understand and to learn about. And you mentioned that in your TED talk, you said it's in court, um, it's, Usually, uh, previously, family courts have seen it as two parents who just can't get along, and they tell them just just go and play nice, you know. And yeah. that's really it's really much more complicated than that. And yeah. um, I know Danica and I we both really appreciate your research um, and your publications. Like Danica said, she uses it to help her parents when she's coaching, and um, I give. Uh, educational presentations to schools to the teachers and school counselors and I use your um, your research in my presentations and it's very eye-opening and I'm finding more and more that um, educators like teachers and school counselors and administrators they want to know uh, about the signs of parental alienation and how to better deal with that in the school settings mm -hmm. and we talk a lot about alienated parents and targeted parents but I think that we're getting more and more viewer, viewers of our show who are alienated kids. And as you know, when you're in an a abusive relationship, as long as you remain under the power, control, and manipulation of your abuser, you're going to stay in that relationship. So when I say alienated kids, I mean kids that are like 18, 19, in their 20s, maybe even 30s. More and more of them are watching um, shows like ours. And... Um, I was wondering, do you have any advice for them? If someone is watching this and they're like in their 20s or 30s and they're a, a child of parental alienation and they're still dealing with this power play, um, how, do you have any advice for them? How, how to manage that situation? How to try to have a relationship with both of their parents? Oh, oh gosh, I don't know. I don't know <laughs> if I have good advice for that. Um, I mean, I think probably the most important thing is to understand it's not your fault. You know, it's not your fault that this has happened and it's not your fault for anything that maybe you've done, you know, over the years. Um, you can't blame yourself for that. I mean, I mean, there are some things, you know, obviously when kids are influenced so strongly to do really antisocial behaviors, um, that, that breaks my heart because they still have to be, children still have to be held responsible when they're doing something really bad, you know, like. I've heard horror stories of kids trying to poison step parents and, and poison pets of the parent and, and destroy their property. And that kind of stuff is, is heartbreaking to see because they've been so manipulated. Um, but I think it's important to understand that usually the other parent knows that that's the situation you're in. You know, I mean, there is, I think, an understanding that you're not, you know, that you're not at fault entirely for this. And, the fault really lies with the parent who's doing this. And sometimes it's not just the parent, it's all the people associated with that parent who are also involved. Um, and so I think that's kind of the most important thing and to try to get some help, try to get some social support and to try to get some mental health to, support to work through a lot of it. Um, because it does, I mean, re 
growing up in that environment, um, kids learn to like they develop blind spots of what they want to see, you know, growing up in that kind of environment, it changes the way you perceive the world. It creates filters of what you pay attention to and what you don't pay attention to. And I think to help move away from that abusive kind of dynamic to try to get some help and support from a, a third party who really is neutral to everything to help call out those blind spots and to help you recognize mm -hmm where you might be, you know, not paying attention to things that just confirm your beliefs, right? Right. <laughs> um, and so because they act like what we call schemas or their frameworks and these frameworks in memory, you know, memories act this way. They, they, we pay attention to things that confirm what we already believe. And we, they, we don't pay attention to things that don't confirm our version of the world. And for alienated children, this is particularly true. It's true of everybody, but particularly true regarding that, that parent that they rejected. And as much as they may want to try to reconcile with them, they also need to try to challenge some of the beliefs that they've adopted mm -hmm. and really work towards trying to fix that and change it. Because it, it'll, it'll benefit them in their other relationships too, if you can do that now when you're young enough. <laughs> I've seen that. I've I've seen that too when an alienated child and again I'm I'm talking about of any age but when they are able to have conversations with a neutral person someone who is not um in, involved in it at all it can really be eye opening for them to talk to someone who is is neutral about their situation and to get their perspective um, in your TED talk, you say, if you're on the outside of this, don't be a bystander. Don't just stand there and, and say and do nothing. So what would you recommend that people do if they are on the outside of this and they're seeing a situation that is probably parental alienation? Um, you have to make tough, be a good friend. You know, if you're actually a friend of this person, call them out. I've, I've called out people that I'm close to and I've said, no, you cannot tell your child that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't care how mature you think your child is, even if they're mm -hmm. 17 years old, they do not need to know about X, you know, mm -hmm. um, they don't need to know about that. That's between you and your ex-husband or you and your ex-wife and they don't like to hear it, but I tell them time and again, and they have to respect me because obviously I, I know what I'm talking about, but, <laughs> but I think, you know, if you know what you're talking about too, I mean, you just say no, you know, I mean, children, even at age 17, they're not an adult yet. I mean, the b human brain does not stop developing until 25. I mean, so children, they think they know a lot. They come across very mature, especially alienated children, mm -hmm. but yet emotionally and mentally, they do not have the capacity to understand the long-term impact of things. And they don't understand how information has been filtered to them that, from a very biased perspective, right? They don't have the full picture. And yet children will often form conclusions right away. They're often very concrete thinkers. They think, you know, it's either this way or that way. They don't understand Mm -hmm. all the nuances of relationships and they shouldn't they shouldn't understand that about their parents that you know um, even if another parent is abusive or even if the other parent did horrible things the child does not need to know that they just need to pre be protected from it and they need to then be have a relationship with them in a way that's safe but never told that that person is abusive even if it's true, never, <laughs> never told that um, because it's, it, it, it hurts their self-esteem. It's part of their identity and they don't have the mental ability to separate out that person from themselves. They, they're not able to. And so I, whenever I see parents doing that, I often have to explain basic human development, like <laughs> basic, basic um, kind of just psychology of human development. Um, so, and if it's not something that you, maybe you've ever taken a class on, I really encourage people, there's free courses on like Coursera and other places, just learn about human development. And, um, and that kind of gives you an understanding about where the children are at, what they're thinking, how they understand the world. Um, and it, oh, eventually when they're older, then you can maybe have a conversation with them, with the child about things that have happened. But mm. I step in and tell my friends things like that all the time. And it's not easy. They, they sometimes don't talk to me for a couple of weeks, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, um, but you know, it, I mean, you're, you're, you're seeing a child being abused and that's yes. kind of the way you have to think about it. And, you know, you know, I know that's kind of a, you know, cliche, you know, it takes a village, but you know, and people don't like to be told what to do, particularly parents. They don't like to be told how to parent their child, but 
you know, if you see a child being abused, mm -hmm. you yeah. know. I well, think this is... Important. This is the only form of abuse that that we don't stand up and speak yeah. out about it. And that's always shocking to me is we talk about all other forms of abuse. We talk about el elder abuse, sexual abuse, um, financial abuse, you know, every other form of abuse. If we see it, we say that's wrong. Don't do that. But this is the only form of abuse where we don't do that. And, and we need to change that. We need to stand up and say that's not okay. Yeah, I, I think part of it is that is when a child, I, I'm talking a, a young child, is saying that, you know, mommy's abusive or whatever, like people, trained experts, teachers are like, wow, why would they say that if it wasn't true? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Which leads yeah. to what would you what would you recommend to professionals who are impacted by these families, teachers, judges, mental health counselors? Like, oh. Yeah, yeah. Well, because I, think I found they're completely off base. Many times they make the wrong, uh, the wrong move for the best interest of the family because maybe the teacher's heart is involved. Right. Exactly. I mean, it's it's hard. Yeah, when you see a child who adamantly believes that thing, and and I think that's a real problem. I mean, I was trained as a psychological counselor, and the way that counselors are trained is to always, and and even as uh, domestic violence advocates are trained, is you always believe the victim. You know, <laughs> and you you don't question it when they come into the office and the kids, you know, or an adult saying, "Oh, all these things have happened." Their job is to validate, make that person feel like they're right and that they're heard and that they're listened to, and you know, it's important to feel supported. However, what if what you're saying is completely false? What if what you're saying is something that's been fed to you and that you've been brainwashed to believe? All that does is make it worse. And so people who are specialists on, tr on addressing parental alienation understand that validating, um, genu or validating feelings that are not genuine makes it worse because now the child is being reinforced for rejecting their true feelings and they are you know, learning to suppress their own actual experiences and deny their own memory of things that have actually happened. And so I think for teachers, it's important to understand like that's a one neutral place for that child to be at. Um, if their child is expressing a lot of hatred and anger about a parent, try to neutralize that, try to say, okay, well, you know, I know that's your, 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 your feelings about it, but try to make it clear that there's always more than one side of the story to help that child really understand that the world is sometimes more complicated than that and maybe you don't know everything. Um, challenge, you don't have to challenge it too much because kids will just dig their heels in, but leave an opening. You know, when kids, when anybody, and this is as a, as a counsel, former counselor and I train counselors, whenever somebody takes an absolute position, you don't want to push them from that. What you want to, you don't want to push them or challenge them on it. What you want to do is leave an opening to kind of allow them an opportunity to step away from that absolute position. You want to give them an opportunity to say, well, maybe there is, maybe there's some exceptions, you know, maybe there are some times when mom or dad isn't so horrible, right? Maybe there, you know, and, 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 and so as a teacher or anybody else involved, you know, try to get that kid to think of something. I mean, most kids will double down and they, they exaggerate and then they blow it up out of proportion because <laughs> that's what alienated children do. But, um, but keep, keep reinforcing that. I think that's important to kind of, you know, don't let them really get ingrained in that. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I, it's, it's a challenge working with families, but I think people who work with these families who do professional counseling and stuff, they really need to change how they approach these families and how they work with them and, and understand, you know, don't reinforce the negative um, beliefs and, and memories that they have. Got it. Well, so, we awesome, have, awesome stuff. Uh, really good stuff. Uh, yeah. Could have kept going, but <laughs> <laughs> everybody, you've you've got to try to come to the Revealing Unseen Child Abuse Symposium in Houston, Texas, October eighteenth, two thousand nineteen, and meet Dr. Harmon in person. And as I said earlier, she's the keynote speaker um, at the symposium, and um, we've got a, a great lineup of presenters at the symposium, and a lot of presenters that are kind of new to the public. So I, I really hope. Um, that if you're watching, you'll try to come to that symposium in uh, Houston in October. Awesome. Can't, cannot wait to meet you there. I'm so excited. Yeah, yeah it'll be great. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, I guess that's it for Custody Matters Live this week. Um, stay tuned for our next guest next week.
um, have a great day, great evening.